Okay, so this is a slide that you guys don't actually have. Um, I wanted to start with it because it's two diploma questions that look like they're the same. Ultimately, what you're given is the exact same thing in both of them. Here, you are given um, a concentration of H3O of sulfuric acid, and that's the one number you get a concentration number. And if you look at this one right here, you actually have a very similar thing here. You have a concentration number of hydrocyanic acid. Now, they ultimately do ask for different end results. They're slightly different. This one wants to know the pOH, and this one wants to know the pH. That being said, do you guys know how to convert between a pH and a pOH really quick? How do you convert between a pH and a pOH? Nope. That's how you convert between a um, concentration and a pOH, yeah. What did you say? Yeah, they add to 14, right? So if you have a pH of 7, you have a pOH of 7. If you have a pH of 1, you have a pOH of 13. So ultimately, although one asks for a pH, one asks for a pOH, they are very, very similar questions. Okay? However, I want to show you guys first, before I do my lesson, um, how they are actually, uh, how, how the mechanism of solving them is slightly different. And then I'll go through my lesson as well. But I thought I'd start with the end in mind and begin by showing you some diploma questions here. So. Um, I'm going to start with the first one up here. And you guys can kind of write down the basics if you want, just off to the side. Really, all you need to know out of question, I guess, numeric response 3 here, is that it's sulfuric acid, and the concentration is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 5. So I'll just write that down on a new slide here. It was sulfuric acid, and the concentration of H3O plus was 1.2 times 10 to the minus 5. Now, for this particular question here, uh, this really consolidates all the stuff we've learned so far. Um, really, the first thing we should do is start by writing out an equation as to what's happening. Because if you have sulfuric acid, why do we even have H3O plus? Well, here's the reason why. H2SO4 would react with water, and it would form HSO4 negative, which is a valid polyatomic. And what's really happening is this guy's a proton thief. The, the water is taking the proton away from the H2SO4. So this guy's a proton donator. This guy is a proton acceptor. And it's going to form the H3O plus. So far, so good. So I'll even write down a few other notes here. This guy donates a proton. This guy accepts proton I can't see the other one as well. um, so if this guy donates a proton he is known as an acid and if this guy accepts a proton it's known as a base so that's one of the things that we had worked on earlier now normally what would want to happen is it's like that hot potato analogy I gave when I did a lesson previously where now the H3O plus has the uh, proton and it might act as a conjugate acid with a conjugate base and this guy would try to give the proton right back to this guy right here and you'd be at equilibrium. And so, I mean, not that that was what the question asked, but a very logical question here could have been, who is the conjugate base? And you would say, well, this guy's the conjugate base. Or it might ask you, who is an acid base pair? And so there's two acid base pairs here. Um, let's see, how can I change colors? For example, this guy and this one right here, those are known as acid-base conjugate pairs. Or, in theory, this one and this one are acid-base conjugate pairs. Okay, let's get to the problem again, though. In order to solve this, we really need to do an ice chart. So I'm going to write that out here, I, C, E. And um, I believe it told us in the previous question that the concentration was 1.2 times 10 to the minus 5. And so that means that if this guy's concentration was that, that's its equilibrium concentration, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 5. Well, I do know a few other things, though. Um, for example, I know that if this guy got up to that value there, it must have been because it started at nothing and it went up by 1.2 times 10 to the minus 5. Because really what happened is we started with a certain amount of sulfuric acid, and it slowly but surely turned into these guys right here before trying to turn back again. 
what else can I fill out here? If this one went up, what else do we know? Say that again. Uh, yeah, this one went up. You said up, right? Because this guy would have started at 0 and went up to 1.2 times 10 to the minus 5. Is this not right? 1.2 times 10 to the minus 5. What about water? Why doesn't it count? Yeah, and liquids don't have variable concentrations, so I don't even need to worry about this table right here. Now, one of the things that I could be asked to do then is work backwards and figure out, well, what was the original concentration of the H2SO4? Well, one of the ways you do that is you maybe use a Ka expression Ka is equal to your products. So my two products would have been the HSO4 negative and the H3O plus. And then my reactant, really the only reactant was the H2SO4 because you can't actually have water's concentration. So in theory, I actually have enough information to try to solve for what this number right here would be. I could, have, I could now tell you what the H2SO4 should be to make this one fit. Because really, this number goes there, this number goes there. Where am I going to find a K value? Yeah, we have a table in your, in your um, um, data book. So go find your data book when you get a moment here and uh, find the K value for HSO, H2SO4. Yeah, it says it's very large. Uh, one of the reasons why is that this is one of the exceptions. And that's why I wanted to go back. I'll go back to the slide here again. I, I started by saying these two questions are very similar in that they both started with a single number as a concentration value. However, the top one, by virtue of it being sulfuric acid, sulfuric acid does not actually exist at equilibrium. I really didn't draw this very nicely. Really, it should only have had a one-way arrow. Because the Ka value is so large that when water takes sulfuric acid's proton, this is where I was being silly and using the Taylor Swift, we're never getting back together idea, but these guys right here, they're, they're not going to reform the initial stuff there, right? We have a definition for that. When something does not reform and like go back the other way, do you guys remember what we call that? That'll work, actually. That wasn't what I was thinking of. Uh, when, we just, when we describe it for an acid, we have a special name for how we call that an acid. We call it a strong acid. Strong acids are the one where they're, they're quantitative. You're right, though, too. We would just use quantitative in general. For acids, we would call them strong. So here's what that means, then. If I was filling out the table, um, I can now fill out the rest of these values. Really, this equation right here is kind of useless to me because really everything changed. So when I'm done, this would have gone down by 1.2 times 10 to the minus 5 and ended up at nothing. And therefore, it must have started at 1.2 times 10 to the minus 5. So there, I can kind of fill out the entire table. Um, ultimately, I haven't even solved the question it asked for yet. I'm just kind of going through what we know about it. So if you guys can kind of follow how this chart would have worked and all the labels that went on, if I go back to the question, it then said, what's the POH? So now that I've kind of got everything set up here, we need to figure out how to calculate a POH. So... Um, a while back, I suggested to you guys to write into your books um, a bunch of different formulas, or possibly even there was a square that had a way for you to go. It looked like this. It was like pH in one corner, pOH in another corner, OH negative here maybe, and H3O plus here. And then this square, there was a way to like convert between all of these things right here. So ultimately, our goal is to try to calculate an OH minus concentration. We just need to try to find a way to... Oh no, we don't want OH minus. We want um, we want POH. Take that back. So we want to try to get here. So, of the things in the square, what do we actually know? We know one of them. Yeah, we know the we know the hydronium concentration, right? Because we know this guy right here. So ultimately, I know this guy in the corner right here. It's got to find a way to get to the side of the square. So, any thoughts? What sort of formulas would be useful for us now? 
Oh, wait, it's Monday morning. How about this one? What if you were to negative log the H3O plus concentration? What does that formula get you? Okay, that'll get you a pH. So really that means that I'm going this way around the, the square. And then I just mentioned earlier today, pH and pOH, the formula for them is that they add to 14. So when I'm done that, if I do 14 minus the pH, that'll get me my pOH. So we'll grab a calculator here and we'll solve the first of the two questions. Then I'll show you the second of the two questions and how they're slightly different before I go into my notes for the day. So what am I doing? Negative logging. 1.2 times 10 to the minus 5. So I calculated a pH of 4.92. So therefore, with a pOH, if I do, let's see, where can I write that? I got 4.92. So if I do 14 minus that, I get an answer of 9.07. You guys able to replicate that and follow that? Okay. Let me go back to the first slide again there. So that was the first one here. But what was special about this one is that sulfuric acid is a strong acid. I'm going to do almost the exact same thing. I promise. They're, they're not nearly the exact same question. Only now I'm going to use the one below here. And so in terms of the important stuff here, it actually gives you an equation. Not that we couldn't have written it ourselves. And then it gives you a concentration of HCM. So I'm going to do a new one here. Uh, it tells you that your concentration of HCM was 0 0.20 moles per liter. And it wants pH. So let me embark on almost the exact same process again. Show you how there's a slight difference there. So I'll do the same thing I started with last time. I'm going to write out an equation. So HCN will react with water. If I was labeling stuff, HCN is going to be a proton donator, which makes it an acid. And it's going to donate its proton to water so that water can form into H3O. Its conjugate base. I really want to start getting into the terminology here, is going to be Cn minus. That'll be the conjugate base. Because this guy right here is the base that is the proton taker, I guess, if you want to call it. And that makes this guy here a conjugate acid. Because what's going to happen is the hot potato game will hopefully occur this time, where he'll, he'll give the proton right back to one of these guys. And it'll be at equilibrium. The only way it won't be at equilibrium is if it is a strong acid. Is HCN a strong acid? No. Because there's only six, right? Only the top six are strong. So this time around, I actually do have an equilibrium. Is okay so far? Now, last time, I was given an H3O plus concentration. And I put it down here in the bottom corner. But this time around, I was given an HCN concentration, which means that like my initial amount of HCN, if I'm writing a nice chart out, must have started at 0 0.20 right here. Uh, same thing as last time. Water is really irrelevant to us because it's a liquid. You can't change a liquid's concentration. And similar to last time, this is all I'm given. Now, the, the, the order of the table is slightly different. But again, you were just literally given one number. Well, we can still fill in some other stuff. For example, right here, I'm going to assume that then these guys started with nothing. and They went up by a certain amount. And that this one went down by a certain amount. But this time around, I actually don't know how much that amount is. So I have to do this. I have to say, well, it went up by an unknown amount x and finished off at x. And this one went down by an amount of x. And when it's finished, it's at 0 0.20 minus x. I've done a few of these with you guys before, but this is why I didn't want to have you guys do your quiz yet until I did one more lesson, because I feel like I want to make sure you've seen enough of these types of questions that you know what to do. I'm going to go into what you do next. Lead. Yeah, 
Yeah, the KC value. Okay. Only let's not call it KC, let's call it KA, because this is an acid. So your KA formula is your products divided by your reactants. So your products will be X times X. Just call it X squared. And your reactants will be 0 0.20 minus X. Only this time around, since cyanic acid is actually a weak acid, and there is, you know, they will reform, unlike the one we just did there. We actually know the K value. Can someone help me out? What's the cyanic acid K value? Okay, we've been here before. Sometime last week, I know we did this. Because I know I made a joke about how you guys had a really good math teacher. Because what are you going to need to do in order to solve this? You guys see the mechanism you're going to use to solve? Yeah, you're going to use the quadratic formula, right? Because what's going to end up happening is the denominator of this side is going to times over here by that. And you're going to end up with this. You're going to end up with, uh, well, I'll just do the math. 6.2 times 10 to the minus 10 has to times by 0.2. So you're going to get 1.24 times 10 to the minus 10. And you're going to have to subtract 6.2 times 10 to the minus 10x. And that's then going to equal x squared. So if you can kind of follow that, really I had to distribute both of these by that number there. So this one times that gives me this constant term. The x times by that stays the same way, and then this x squared sits there. And all I've got to do now is bring everything to one side, make it equal to zero. So let's just slide this over here. Now I'm going to x squared plus 6.2 times 10 to the minus 10x minus 1.24 times 10 to the minus 10, and that's all equal to zero. Quadratic formula time. Only it really sucks because your coefficients are like these stupid, ridiculous numbers. Here we go. Negative b. Negative 6.2 times 10 to the minus 10. Plus or minus b squared. So 6.2 times 10 to the minus 10 squared minus 4 times 1. By the way, the first constant should almost always be 1. I can't think of too many examples why it wouldn't be. And then the C value would be minus 1.24 times 10 to the minus 10. And then this all gets divided by 2A, but since A is just 1, it's divided by 2. So. Um, I did the positive of the two square roots myself. Since I got a value that works, I'm not going to bother doing. You know how you always get two answers with the square with a quadratic formula. One's probably negative, and the negative one doesn't really make sense. It'll be extraneous. So I ended up getting this. I got 1.1135 times 10 to the minus five. That's one of my answers. Anybody else gets that? Oh, uh, 1.24 times 10 to the minus 10. Only negative numbers. Because it was when I when I did this times that, I got 1.24 times 10 to the minus 10. 0.2 times that one there. But then I had to bring it to the other side and make the negative value. For those of you guys who tried this, were you able to get the value I got here by using the positive of the two ones, positive squared.
So here's what I can do. Assuming you can get that, I can fill out the rest of my table. But you guys see how filling out this table is different than the last one. The last one, because there was no equilibrium, I just assumed that everything that we started with turned over here. But how much did we actually make? Not that much. Which kind of makes sense, though, because was HCN one of my strong assets? How high is it on the list? Like, it's probably, like, almost at the bottom, right? So does it form some products? Sure, but it's a... Uh, remember when I talked about strong and weak? It's a weak acid because it tries to give away its proton and immediately it goes back again, right? And so in terms of numbers here, really, this number here, then, is 1.11 times 10 to the minus 5. If I just pull this all back down so I can work back up here again. This one is 1.11 times 10 to the minus 5. Uh, this right here is 1.11 times 10 to the minus 5. And I want to talk about that for a sec here. Um, means this is 1.11 times 10 to the minus 5. When you try to calculate how much equilibrium concentration of H HCN you have, this is often what occurs. When you take 0 .0, 0 0.20 and you subtract this amount right here, effectively nothing changes. Because if you were to line that up, oh, breakfast is here. Pause for a second. Uh, apples, oranges, cheese, yogurt, pears. 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 Okay. Okay. Thanks, guys. If you were to line up the sig digs here, one of the things that I wanted to use this example to try to illustrate before I went through my notes for the day is that um, where should I do this? Oh, I'll do it right below here. 0 0.020. If you minus this number right here, that would be 0.123411. You guys remember your sig dig rules for adding and subtracting? Like you have to line things up with the last decimal place you have. And so since this right here kind of cut off right here, what happens when you take 0 0.20 and you subtract? Well, effectively nothing. What are you left with? Yeah, 0 0.020. 0 point, or 0 0.20. Like really nothing changes here. I'm going to show you guys a little bit later that there's actually a little um, a shortcut that you can take so that you don't have to use the quadratic formula sometimes. I'll get to that in my notes a little bit later. But we're, we're now ready to finally solve the question. I know it's been a while now, but remember how our goal was to find the pH? This is really no different now than the question. This is the question we did beforehand, where once you have your entire table filled out, you're looking to do this sort of square here. Uh, last time around, we started with an H3O plus and went to a pOH. This time around, we want to start from an H3O plus and go to a pH. So let's see, what can I work on here? Here's my H3O plus concentration, what I just solved for for x. So all I'm going to have to do to calculate pH is negative uh, this answer right here, and that will then give me a pH. So negative log the answer, and this time I got 4.95. At the end of the day, these two questions look very similar. Because both of them are going to involve some steps. Uh, the steps that are in common is that you needed to make an ice table and you needed to negative log your concentration to get a pH. But the mechanisms were different. One of them, since it was a strong acid, you really couldn't make a Ka expression. Whereas on the second one here, you absolutely had to make a Ka expression. And in fact, we had to use the quadratic formula to try to figure it out. You guys able to follow that? Because that's ultimately what I need to get you guys to. That's why I wanted to start with some old diploma questions. Why don't I walk you guys through my notes now, and we'll, we'll do more examples along the way, but hopefully this will help consolidate the goal. So I'll just show you those two questions one more time, because I know you don't have them in front of you. The first one here was numeric response, and it literally was just, I want to know the pOH based on this concentration of sulfuric acid. But what was special is sulfuric acid is strong. So you really you write your ice table a little bit differently. Here it was a very, very similar concept. Again, just like here you were given a concentration, here you were also given just a single number's concentration. Um, but when you did all the work, you actually had to use a Ka value in your data book to try to solve for that. So, let me go through my notes for the day here. That's kind of the goal now, is to help teach you guys how to be able to use the Ka table in your data booklet. And so I've, I have, I've already shown you guys this to some degree before. Basically, a Ka value is just the Kc value specifically for acids. And in your data booklet, it basically it's a ranking scheme, right? The strong ones are at the top all the way down to the weakest of all acids. What is our weakest acid? Yeah, water. Because does water make 
Hydronium, yeah, two times in a billion, which is why its pH is 7, because 2 in a billion gives you a concentration of 1 times 10 to the minus 7. Say that one more time. 2 times in a billion leads to a concentration of 1 times 10 to the minus 7. And then when you negative log 1 times 10 to the minus 7, you get a pH of 7. And so water does actually produce hydronium, but it does not last like that for long, right? As soon as it breaks up into a hydroxide and a hydronium, almost immediately it just finds somebody else and reforms water again. So, uh, What else do I got on here? That's basically what this slide here talks about then. The first six are strong. So yeah, quantitatively and strong, those, really, those words really go together. We just use strong with the word acid. So what I need for you guys to know then is that uh, all strong acids, though, are considered to be equivalent, actually. I've kind of mentioned that there's a kind of a ranking scheme here. Really, those top six, though, they're interchangeable because really all six of them react 100% of the time effectively. So you really can't say that perchloric acid is actually better than hydrochloric. They're really, they're just all equivalent to each other. Here's kind of a generic idea of how the, how the Ka value might look then. If I ask you to find a Ka for one of these acids, it's always going to be H3O plus and something over something because water, water we always have to cross out because water doesn't have a concentration. I don't know whether I have a slide on it like this later, so I'm going to show you this now. Often we abbreviate it like this then. We say that you're always making hydronium. That's, that's a guarantee. And it's because you have some sort of acid, HA is often a nice abbreviation for an acid, A for acid, and H because it has an extra proton. Only this guy right here would be the one that has the proton taken off. So you'd actually want to make this guy A negative. And then on the bottom of the equation, that's where you'd call it HA. So this guy is the original acid, and this guy would be known as its conjugate base. And this is, in general, the formula for how this works. And it can really work for any of the acids that aren't the strong acids, by the way. Right? This could be CN negative, and this could be HCN. This could be H2PO4, and this could be H3PO4. I guess it would be a negative on that guy. All right, like it, it all works the exact same sort of way. Uh, here I have a slide talking about some of the stuff I mentioned earlier. You have to make sure you get your terminology right. Concentrated and dilute refer to like the numerical value you assign to it. So if something has a concentration of 1.5 moles per liter, that's concentrate. If it has a concentration of 0 0.00001372, that's dilute. Strong and weak are based on how much they ionize. So there's only the six strong acids because they're the ones that are quantitative. So make sure you use the terminology properly. So basically, here's, here's what we're looking to do today. I've already done a couple of examples. I'll do some more in the next few slides here. But really, there's two things we end up doing. One, we either try to calculate a Ka value. This is pretty rare. They don't normally want you to calculate a Ka value. And the reason why is that all the Ka values are already in your data booklet. So why would we bother to calculate them? But I have seen questions before where they ask you to calculate a Ka value for an acid that's not in your book. Okay. So they just find an extra one. The second one's more likely here. You're more likely to use a Ka value to then use an ice table, predict hydronium ion concentration, and then probably after that, a very likely thing they'll do is have you find a pH or a pOH, which is what we did in, our, in the examples that I gave the diploma questions to start class. This is the more likely thing. There's almost always a numeric response question on this. And it sucks because it's actually a lot of work. Let's try some examples, some more examples. Not all of these are quite as challenging as the ones we started with. So I'm going to go a little bit faster now if that's okay. We've got a pH of a solution of acetic acid to be measured at 2.38. Let's find the Ka value for acetic acid. I don't think you'd ever be asked this question because if they want you to find the Ka value for acetic acid, you literally would just go to your data book and say, hey, there it is, done. Right? But for practice's sake, let's go through the motions again. You would say something like this. HA is going to react with water to form H3O plus and a negative. Specifically, this time it's acetic acid. But honestly, why bother writing out acetic acid? It's the exact same thing every time. And let's skip writing water because we never need to worry about water. 
I could then fill out a few numbers in my chart. If the acetic acid is one mole per liter, that's because, well, this guy right here is started at one mole mole per liter. And hydronium and your conjugate base probably started at nothing. Okay, this is the pH value right here. It says the pH is equal to 2.38. You guys remember how to convert a pH into a hydronium concentration? Remember the formula for that? Yeah. So there's a formula that says if you want to try to calculate a hydronium ion content, you go 10 to the negative of that number there. So if I go 10 to the power negative 2.38, uh, I get this value here. It was uh, 0 0.004. One six, etc. Because really, I can then start doing this. Well, this must have gone up by an unknown amount. I'm not even going to bother calling it x because I know what it's going to end up being. When we were done, it was 0 0.00416, etc. This one was also 0 0.00416. Because really, this went up by an amount. Well, this guy must have gone down by an amount. But if I subtract, if I, if I actually do the math, 0 0.1.00 and I go 0 0.00416, how much was really lost? Nothing. I gave a really silly analogy um, last week of Scrooge McDuck and his money bin. And if you were to take three coins out of his big stack of money, well, he probably would notice. But, like, you probably shouldn't notice. For the, these guys over here, when they take even this minuscule amount, it makes a huge difference. Because they literally went from nothing to something. But for this guy over here, when he lost that tiny amount there, did it, does it really matter at the end of the day? Like, if a billionaire happens to lose 42 cents in the washing machine, who cares? Right? He's still a billionaire, right? But for, I don't know, someone who needs to have enough change to... I don't know, buy their food for the day, like a, a kid living in Africa who needs 42 cents for their daily supply of rice. 42 cents is all the difference in the world. You get what I'm saying there? So perspective matters here. These guys right here went up, but this guy right here, when I subtract that, effectively he's still at one, actually. Sig dig wise, nothing has actually changed because when you pop your sig dig here, there's actually really no effective loss. Does that make sense what I'm saying there? It actually leads to an assumption. We often assume that really when you subtract this amount right here, that it really doesn't matter how much you lose because when you subtract it away, it really doesn't change much. So uh, We're basically ready for our last step then, to find the Ka value. K the board is not working quite as well. The Ka value is then going to be 0 0.00416 squared, because there's really two of these guys. And when I'm done, divide by 1. That's right here. No, because you'll actually divide by 1, because effectively this number right here, when you subtract those, I agree. In this case right here, though, an exception's been made. It actually says so on the bottom of your table here. Can you guys find the table down there? It says, note, an approximation may be used instead of the quadratic formula. And then it kind of gives some rules here. I'll explain those rules there later. But basically, the idea is, you know that subtracting this of x right there? It actually is saying that we can actually ignore that just to save some time. Okay, I'll read, read that note there a little bit later and show you exactly what it means on a different example. But yeah, we don't actually need to subtract those numbers there. Okay, so all I gotta do basically is take the number I have and square it. So I've got a Ka value now of uh, 1.7 times 10 to the minus five. What was the Ka value in your data booklet? Okay, so pretty close. Um, the only reason why it might be different, I would think, one is that experimental data doesn't always come out the same as theoretical data. That's one possibility. Uh, two is that this is actually temperature dependent. 
And so if you change the temperature, you can actually change the K value. And I want to take a second to talk about why temperature matters. You guys recall Le Chatelier's principle a little bit? I don't know which side of the equation here has heat on it. So just hypothetically, let's say endothermic. Let's say that it's endothermic. If you were to heat this up, what does that do to the equation? Well, it shifts it this way. And then if you shift it this way, you make more H3O+. Plus. And if you make more H3O+, plus, well, then that's going to change this number right here. And if you change that number right here, can you see how it would cascade down? So it is definitely temperature dependent. And so you can actually mess around with Ka values of things by changing temperatures. Let's try another example here. Carbonic acid. A student measures the pH of carbonic acid to be this. Let's calculate the K value. So honestly, this is the exact same type of question. So I'm going to kind of go a little bit faster than I have in the past. So HA, we're going to add water to it. It's going to form H3O plus and A negative. I don't care about water because I never do. Wait, right, carbonic acid, its initial amount was 0 0.25. This guy would have been zero, this guy would have been zero, and it's going up. And this one's going down. Well, it gave me the pH. The pH was 3.48. So if I do a quick little calculation, 10 to the power minus 3.48 gives me 3.31. times 10 to the minus 4. So that means that this is 3.31. 3 times 10 to the minus 4. This one's 3.31 times 10 to the minus 4. And then this exact same thing happens over here again. Zero point two five minus three point three one. If I actually wrote it, that would be zero point zero 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 three three one. The amount that you subtract there is so negligible that we've actually been told specifically, feel free just to omit it because it really doesn't make much of a difference. So just guy as zero point two five. So find the Ka value then. It'll be 3.31 times 10 to the minus 4. That gets squared because you have both of these. And when you're done, you'll divide by 0 0.25. Square that and then divide by 0.25. I got a Ka value of 4.4. Uh, times 10 to the minus 7. Uh, let's see, where's carbonic acid? Okay, so in your data book, it was 4.5 times 10 to the minus 7, so pretty close. That makes sense? Honestly, that's one of the easier ones to do because there's really not as many steps, and when you're doing it this direction here, you never have to do like quadratic equations or, or solving algebra type stuff. Um, if it's okay with you guys, this is the exact same type of question there. I won't bother doing this one here, because really, you do the exact same thing, right? You would take 0 0.040, that goes up in the top corner. The sulfuric acid number, you would negative log it, you'd put it down here, you'd do the whole subtracting thing. It may make a difference, by the way. 0 0.400, when you subtract your X amount, it might actually make it so that this number right here actually matters. But unless the sig digs do, don't worry about it. And then you'd just solve with your formula. So... I'd rather, if I could, then move on to the second type of question, which is where I'm actually going to ask you to try to calculate the H3O and pH value instead. And so these questions are notorious because literally all you're given is a single number. They'll give you an initial concentration, and that's all you get. The idea here being that what we're trying to do is we're trying to reverse engineer this from a Ka value. So this one will look something more like this. Methanoic acid is just a generic acid. Again, add to water form H3O plus and your conjugate base. Okay, 
so this value up here in the top corner is 0 0.200. Water doesn't count. You guys are at zero. And you guys go up and you go down. I'll just pause there so you can catch up. Can you guys see how this one's got a slight tweak to it, though, compared to the last two or three we did? Last time around, I gave you the pH or a concentration. This time, I didn't. And so what we're kind of stuck with here is that this guy right here is x, this one here is x, and this is 0 0.200 minus x. And I'm really not sure whether this x matters or not, because if the concentration is high enough that it matters, then when I write out my expression, it looks something like this. My Ka value is equal to x squared divided by 0 0.200 minus x. And you can look up the Ka value for methanoic acid because it's literally in my book. So what's methanoic acid's Ka value? Find it. Okay. So here's the issue then. Yeah, methanoic is formic. So what we would then need to do is the exact same thing we did in one of the, our earlier diploma questions. You'd have to take this number and times by everything up over here, and that's kind of a pain in the butt, which is why there's an approximation that's allowed, and that's where the little thing, the little blurb at the bottom of your data book that comes in. So Cassie, I'm going to steal yours. Read it out here. So if you guys can find that little note that's sitting literally at the bottom here, let's read it out here. An approximation may be used instead of the quadratic formula when the concentration of H0 plus produced is less than 5%. So basically the, the stuff in brackets is what, you, what matters here. If the concentration of the acid is a thousand times greater than the Ka value, what we're allowed to do is skip the quadratic formula. So um, take your Ka value right here, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 4, and times by a thousand. Okay. I get 0 0.18. So I took my Ka value and it times by 1,000, I got 0 0.18. Is that still less than your initial concentration? Yeah, my initial concentration was 0 0.20. So the rule they're giving us then is that we don't actually need to use the quadratic formula. What we're allowed to do is assume that the amount of x that we're subtracting is so negligible that it really doesn't make a difference. And here's why that's helpful then. Minus x right here doesn't need to be here anymore. I don't actually need the quadratic formula. Because all I have to do is time 0 0.200 up to this side over here, and then I square root and I'm done. Now that only works if, take your Ka value times by 1,000, if it's still less than your initial concentration, then we can assume that it's small enough, it's really, it's really irrelevant. So I'm going to take 1.8 times 10 to the minus 4 times by 0 0.2. And then when I square root all of that, I end up with 0 0.006. So 0. Yeah, everybody else get 0 0.006? So let's fill out the rest of our table here. And you're going to discover that our approximation, we are cheating. Because if this value right here is 0 0.006, and this one is 0 0.006, if this was 0 0.006, would it have made a difference? Actually, yeah, it would have. Because 0 0.200 minus 0 0.006, to make it so that this thing right here should have been 0 0.19. So this is why we, were, we really are cheating, right? Because ideally we should have used the quadratic formula to do this exactly. And to assume that this would have stayed at 0 0.200 is a little bit unfair. But um, that being said, we do have what we need now, though. Do our H3O plus concentration? Yeah, it was the 0 0.006 that I just calculated over here. And so if that's a moles per liter, 
for hydronium if I want to try to calculate a pH, pH out of it. Yeah, negative log. So if you negative log this number, uh, I got a pH of 2.22. That makes sense. We probably should have used the quadratic formula. However, the rules in our data booklet specify as long as you times your Ka by 1,000, if it's still smaller than initial concentration, you can go ahead and cross off this x squared right here. And then when you cross off this x squared right here, it's so much easier to solve. Yeah. It probably should hardly make a difference. Like we could we could try a couple of them side by side and see. But the idea, the, the reason for the approximation is that the amount of the minus x right here would be so tiny that it hardly would make a difference. Like you'd be you'd be you'd be taking this number right here and you'd be timesing by like 0 0.1999999. And so like it's going to be slightly different, but it probably won't make a difference once sig digs come into play. So long story short, to answer your question, if it does fit the rule, then use the approximation. Let's try another one then. I'm going to give you hydrocyanic acid. I'm going to give you an initial concentration here. Let's calculate the h 3 and pH. So HA, cyanic acid, will react with water, which we don't care about anyways. At equilibrium, it forms H3O+. Plus and it forms a conjugate base. This initial number right here is 0 0.500. By the way, I'm kind of speeding through this because after a while you start to recognize that all of these questions get set up almost in the exact same way. This will go down, this will go up, and you'll be left with this. Really, the only difference between this chart and the last chart is whatever number we start with in the corner here. It's like it's the exact same thing. Okay, what is the K value for hydrocyanic acid? I think we did this one earlier. So imagine this k value. I'm not even going to do the calculation. Say you times this by 1,000. Is it going to be bigger than 0 0.500? Not even close. So here's why that's useful then. We're allowed to use the approximation that says, don't really worry about subtracting x. It really shouldn't make a difference. So when I try to calculate my formula, you'll end up getting x squared. Well, since that's x and your x value, we, we now finally have the H3O plus value, because that's what we wanted. If you want a pH, all you have left to do is negative log this thing. So if you negative log this value here, you'll get yourself a pH. So, negative... Calculator's battery's just dead. No. Six point two times ten to the minus ten times one point five square root. Or did you negative log that? Uh, I got four point seven five. Um, I should point out the rules, sig dig rules for pH, because I don't want you to get that wrong. 
shoot, my calculator just died again. Was it, what did I say? 4.75, something like that? Okay. Um, that's actually going to be the right number of sig digs, um, but we should talk about why. This here we started with had three sig digs. However, your Ka value pulled out of your data booklet only has two sig digs. You're always going to be limited, I guarantee you, to two sig digs if you use a number out of your data booklet because all of the Ka values only have two sig digs. This number right here is a pH. Do you guys recall we count the numbers after the decimal place? So it looks like this has three digits, but this four right here does not count as a sig dig. So that's why I went with 4.75 rather than 4.8. If you wrote 4.8, you don't have enough sig digs because this right here is only one sig dig for pH. That makes sense? Okay, the second part of my lesson here is, well, if we can do a Ka for acids, what's stopping us from doing a Kb for, wait for it, this will surprise you, bases. Whoa. Spoiler, wow. Okay. This is actually one of the easiest things to do. Um, a lot of kids, they'll forget about this when it comes to diplomas because they'll see a Kb value and all of a sudden they'll freak out going, I don't have a Kb value. Okay. Um, there's actually a really easy way to calculate it. I'm going to show you a proof for it on the next slide right here. Okay, This is complicated, so don't stress out if you don't follow the proof. As long as you understand the formula when you're done, we're good. So here's the proof for how this would work. This formula right here specifically is acetic acid. And this is acetic acid, our Ka, reacting with water to form H3O plus and our conjugate base. That shouldn't overly be new. And if I made a Ka value for it, it would look like this. However, imagine that this thing right here was acting as a base. Here's how it would look like as a base. If this guy was a base, it would react with water, its proton to this guy right here. And if water gave its proton to this guy right here, it would now reform the acid, only now it's going to make OH minus. Now, maybe that seems odd because you're like, hang on, Chris, why would it form OH minus? But don't forget. Doesn't water form OH minus just naturally on its own every once in a while? No, water has the ability to give away its proton. Doesn't do it often, but it can. Well, this would then be a Kb expression, where this is the thing acting as a base, accepting a proton forming here. Now, watch this, though. What if I take this Ka expression right here and this Kb expression right here, and hypothetically, let's just say I multiply them, just, I don't know, because. What you discover is that this one and this one would cancel this one and this one would cancel right here. And the only thing that you'd be left with would be H3O plus and no H minus. Well, that's what happens when you times Ka by Kb. But think about that for a second. What does an acid and a base normally produce? Water. And really, isn't H3O plus and OH minus, isn't that what the Kw expression is anyways? So here's what this means then. Even if that proof didn't make sense to you, here's how you solve this. If you ever want to find the Kb value, all you have to do is take Kw and divide by Ka. So this is a final formula to throw in your data booklets. Kw, water, is really the product of an acid and a base. So if you can find me a Ka value through either some math or through... If you want to find a Kb value for a base, just divide the Ka value from Kw. So it's actually ridiculously easy, but a lot of kids, they'll forget about this and forget that there's just a simple formula for solving for a base value. So, like I actually threw two examples on the same slide here because it's actually ridiculously simple. So let's try this one here. It's sodium benzoate. Sodium benzoate would be Na, and then it, I believe it's C6H5. COOH. Oh, actually, not the H, just COO. So the H has been replaced by the sodium. That would be sodium benzoate. If I were to ask you to try to write this thing out as though it's like ionic or covalent, the first thing you might do is dissociate it. Okay, well, this means you have, oops, this means you have an Na plus and a C6. H five C O O negative. Sorry, that's six H five C O O negative. 
Are either of these two things acidic or basic yet? No. But what I can do is I can take the six H five C O O negative, add it to water. And what would happen is OH minus would occur because water is going to give its proton to that guy right there and form C6H5. This is what I was screwing up the first time. COOH because it's going to finally finish it off with that final H there. All right, this guy's a base. I started by writing out the formula. I dissociated it into two pieces. The second of the two pieces I added to water the proton left the water and came over here. Now if I want to label stuff then, water would have been an acid because it gave its proton to this guy as a base, making this base and this conjugate acid. Okay, now, now for the easy part, because that was, really wasn't even part of the question. All you have to do then to calculate a Kb value is a A times Kb equals Kw. So you just have to take Kw and divide by a Ka value. Do I have a Ka value for this guy I can look up in a data booklet? Yeah. Let's just take 1 times 10 to the minus 14 and divide by 1. Where is benzoic acid on here? Oh, there it is. Uh, benzoic acid is right at the uh, page break. 6.3 times 10 to the minus 5. Gives me a KB value of, I think it was 1.6 before my calculator died. Yeah, with sig digs, I guess I got just two though, because this one only had two. So 1.6 times 10 to the minus, what was it? Okay, minus 10. My calculator literally has enough batteries to do like one thing before it does. That's it. Now that we have a KB value. Let me do one more example here. So we want to do it for ammonia. Um, if you wanted to write out the equation just to kind of get your idea. Ammonia, you guys have probably seen me do this one before. Ammonia can then be added to water. And if you do that, it forms NH4 plus and OH minus. Because proton leaves from water over here to ammonia. So you're a base. You're an acid. You are the conjugate acid and the conjugate base. Okay, well, if I want to find the Kb for this guy right here, all I have to do is Kb is Kw minus Ka. I just need to have its conjugate acid. So it'll be 1 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by whatever ammonia is. One is so. Ammonium is almost at the bottom. It's the fifth one from the bottom. It's 5.6 times 10 to the minus 10. I got 1.8 to the minus 5. 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. That makes sense. Oh, yeah, last thing. Um, this actually kind of comes almost full circle back to one of the things we would have done back in Chem 20. Um, there are certain species that we actually don't know whether they're an acid or a base. I'll give you an example. One, 
Uh, let's say I gave you NaHCO3. You guys probably don't need to write this one down. Uh, if you were to try to figure uh, NaHCO3 could dissociate into Na plus and HCO3 negative, and then the HCO3 negative could react with water and try to form CO3 2 negative, and uh, what would that make it? H3O plus. There, I made it an acid. Or HCO3 negative could try to react with water, form H2CO3, and OH minus, and now I've made it a base. And it's likely both of these will be at equilibrium for this to occur. And we had this problem ever since the beginning of Chem 20 as well. How do I know which one it is? Well, now we actually have a way of figuring this out. Okay. It's called an amphoteric entity. If something is amphoteric, it means it can act as either an acid or a base, and we're not really sure which one it is. And so the way we figure it out is we figure out whether it has a larger Ka value or a larger Kb value. Both of the values are going to be very small, like both of them will be less than 1, which means that you don't produce a lot of product. But whichever one you produce more of, whether you produce more acid or base, that'll tell you what ends up happening. Because really what's occurring is both of these reactions are happening. Really, this thing right here is producing both acid and base. To figure out which one is predominant, I just got to figure out whether Ka is bigger than Kb or not. If Ka is bigger than Kb, then more of this is getting produced than this. Right? And keep in mind, as you acid and as you produce base, what are they going to do to each other anyways? They'll neutralize each other. But if there's more of this, then it'll be acidic. Okay? So all I'll do then to try to figure out one that we're unsure of is calculate the Ka value and the Kb value and compare. So this is my last slide finally. I'm going to give you NaHSO3. And we want to figure out whether it's going to be acidic or basic. So I'll do the exact same steps I kind of started with. NaHSO3 will dissociate into Na plus and into an HSO3 negative. I haven't proved that this is acidic or basic yet. But I could take the HSO3, and I can actually make it do two reactions. And it will underdo both, by the way. If I react it with water, I can make this guy form SO3 2 negative, and that'll produce hydronium. And at the exact same time, HSO3 could react with water and form H2SO3 and a hydroxide. Both of these reactions are taking place. And when I first taught you guys Chem 20, I don't think we were in a place for me to describe for you the fact that multiple reactions can be taking place at the same time. We just, I don't think we were there yet. But hopefully now you can understand that really you're producing some of this and some of this and some of this and some of this. What's going to happen between the Hydronium and the hydroxide, well, they'll, they'll neutralize each other. However, there's going to be more of one of these two. We just have to figure out which one there's more of. So for the first one, we need to figure this guy out as a Ka value, as an acid. So we need to find HSO3 negative and just literally look up its, its Ka value. So find your chart. I'm going to steal Cassie's here. Look in the first column for HSO3. Uh, it's about, what, 8 from the bottom maybe? I got 6.3 times 10 to the minus 8. So this guy was a 6.3 times 10 to the minus 8. This is Ka value. Does this thing produce a lot of hydronium? Well, no, but we knew that already. The question is, does it produce more hydronium than this guy produces hydroxide? So the first one, you literally just look it up in your book. For the second one, if I want to find this guy's B value, I have to look at this conjugate acid's Ka value and, and uh, calculate it. So that's the calculation we just did. What you're going to do is you're going to take Kw and divide by Ka. Here's the mistake I find kids often make. They try to divide it by this Ka. But what we have to do is divide by its conjugate acids Ka value. So you have to go look H2SO3, look up its Ka value to make this guy's base. So it's 1 times 10 to the minus 14 
And it's not divided by this number here. It's divided by, where's HSO3? Oh, HSO3 is the second one below hydronium. It's 1.4 times 10 to the minus 2. So I have a KB value of 7.1 to the minus 13. So here's what that means. Take it from the top. This guy right here can act as an acid. I literally looked its number up in the data book as it was. I recognize that this stuff tries to make hydronium. It really does, but like it immediately turns back. You really don't make much hydronium but that's fine. I also recognize that this thing will also simultaneously also react as a base. And it really, I'm not really sure which one is going to take priority until I do a calculation. As it tries to react as a base, it's going to produce this conjugate acid. And then immediately as to produce it, it's going to turn right back again. Now, if I want to figure out its KB value, the math basically, if you want that proof again, it was a few slides back. But the way it works then is it's this guy's Ka value divided by Kw. Do not take 1 times 10 to the minus 14 and divide by this one here. That won't work. You have to find its conjugate acid in the data booklet, divide those, and now this guy's Kb value, this was a 7.1. So will this stuff turn into that acid? Yeah, but like even more rarely than the top one was. So what will this one end up being? It's an acid. Okay, let me do a quick summary of what we hopefully accomplished today, and then um, I hope this will help consolidate what we want to try on our first quiz. So, um, we talked more about how to use Ka values in your data booklet, and there's really there's two ways you do it. Either I give you the Ka value, and you have to work backwards and find a concentration, or they may ask you to actually calculate a Ka value. That one's more rare, but it's possible. If the Ka times by a thousand is still smaller than your initial concentration, you can skip the whole quadratic formula part, which is really nice because it saves you a lot of time. The other things we learned were towards the end of the lesson here, you can find a Kb value, Kb just being for bases, right? And the only difference there is all you're going to do is take your Ka value and divide, by, divide from Kw. The reason why that's useful is for the amphoteric stuff. If we're not sure whether it's an acid or a base, now we can tell. Let me give you one more example of an amphoteric one, and then we'll call it a day. If I were to give you, say, NaH2PO4, this can really break up into Na+, plus, but I'm going to skip that, and uh, H2PO4 negative, which can turn into H3PO4 and OH-, minus, or it can turn into HPO4 2-, minus, and H3O plus. It actually does both. So here's how we'd solve this. I would find H4's Ka value just directly out of the book. Stop. I would look this guy's conjugate acid number up in the data booklet. Oh, I did that wrong, actually. This one would be for the Ka value, which is actually the bottom one. I would look up this guy's value in the book. I would take Kw, divide by Ka, to get me a KB, and then whoever wins out between these two, that's how I know. So. Okay, any questions? You guys able to follow today's lesson? Okay, here's where I need you guys to trust me a little bit. Um, you kind of just need to now write a quiz. Because you can practice some of this stuff, but honestly, I think the best way of doing this sometimes is just to me, for me to say, here's a bunch of old diploma questions, try it. Um, what I normally do is I normally have three quizzes. I've cut it down to two quizzes. Here's what we can do, though. If you guys absolutely tank tomorrow's quiz, I can give you, like, the extra quiz as, like, a requiz if you really want. So I'll let that kind of be your discretion. 
So let's try a quiz tomorrow. And if that one doesn't take, then I can give you a makeup one. Okay. Wednesday, we'll do a, uh, our last lesson then. Then we'll finish the unit. And then we'll do a quiz and a unit test next week. So. Sound good? Awesome. Okay, I'm done. Thanks for your patience.